Hi everyone. Welcome to Reconciliation Pop-Ups with Janet and Jess. I'm Janet. I'm Jess. Hi Jess. So Hi, Jess. everyone, <laughs> this is part two of your Reconciliation Pop-Ups. If you haven't seen part one yet, please go find it because there is part one. This fine group of mass messaging is being brought to you by Trellis and Alberta Recreation and Parks Association. So we're just gonna launch right into it. In two, pop-up number two, our shared history with Indigenous peoples. So this is one of, um, it, I know for, if you were listening to part one, just kind of mentioned a bit of a um, deeper, a little heavier part of our history and part of our series, but I think it's actually one of the more important parts that you will be actually listening to. So what we're gonna do is Jess is gonna talk about Indian residential schools, and then I will talk about policies and how, um, how they affect the work that you do. So Jess, we're going into part two. I'm gonna stop my screen and then you will um, pick it up and share this video with us. So you ready? All right, I'm just gonna put CC's closed captions on just to ensure that everybody has the same opportunity to know what is being stated. Reconciliation. It's a word you often hear, especially when discussing the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada. But in light of recent events, some aren't sure they even want to talk about reconciliation anymore. When a 15-year-old Anishinaabe girl was found dead, dumped in a river and no one was held responsible, and the young Cree man was shot dead and the shooter was acquitted. Both of these recent cases have re-exposed a deep rift between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada. It's a divide that goes back hundreds of years. When Europeans arrived in North America and began settling the land, they didn't stop at just taking land from Indigenous peoples. They brought with them a policy to snuff out the so-called Indian problem. The first Indian residential schools started opening in the 1870s beginning of what some have called the darkest chapter in Canadian history. What took place in residential schools amounts to nothing short of cultural genocide. By 1920, the Indian Act was amended to make it mandatory for status Indian children to attend residential school. When their parents refused to send them away, police showed up and forcibly took them. It's estimated that 150,000 children were taken from their families and placed in these schools where they were stripped of their culture and their language. The goal was assimilation, to quote, kill the Indian in the child. Thousands of children died, with some estimates saying the mortality rate was as high as 60% in some of the schools. Those who survived have shared horrific stories, of physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. The last residential school closed in 1996. The impacts of those institutions are still palpable today. Indigenous communities have shown incredible resilience in the centuries since Europeans arrived, but the impacts of intergenerational trauma and colonization still run deep. In 2007, the largest class action settlement in Canadian history recognized the damage inflicted by residential schools. Canada formally apologized the following year. These objectives were based on the assumption that Aboriginal cultures and spiritual beliefs were inferior and unequal. Indeed, some saw it, as was infamously said, to kill the Indian in the child. Today, we recognize that this policy of assimilation was wrong, has caused great harm, and has no place in our country. The Residential School Settlement Agreement established a multi-billion dollar fund to support survivors in their recovery. One of the outcomes of this agreement was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The commission traveled across the country, heard testimony from thousands of residential school survivors. In 2015, the commission produced its final report. It included 94 calls to action, calls meant to redress the legacy of the residential school system, and hopefully lead to reconciliation. So what's changed since then? Some ask if this country has even grasped the truth of our shared history 
What actions have been taken? How far have we come? Indigenous people currently account for roughly 5% of the population, and yet nearly half of all the children in care in this country are Indigenous. More than a quarter of the adults locked up in prisons are Indigenous. The National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls may be well underway, but the deaths and disappearances continue today. It's time to take a hard look at this country's progress on reconciliation. You can go ahead and reshare your screen, Janet. So it's important um, to understand a little bit about um, our shared history and the truth of our history. Um, a lot of Canadians still are unaware of residential schools and the impact that they have had in our communities. Um, and so I, I stress to you to take this um, initiative to understand the TRC, to understand the 94 calls to action, um, and hear the stories of the survivors. Um, they were vulnerable enough to share what, what happened to them. And so we have to honor um, what they've gone through. Um, and as we go forward in this series, we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like for our communities and how do we actually do that work. Thanks, Jess, for that. And um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So I think um, we will talk, we will come back to TRC as part of our policy piece. And one thing an elder has pointed out to me recently which was quite fascinating, um, is that the last residential school closed just five years before 9-11 happened. And it's interesting because 9-11 in the States has that huge piece, like we all historically know about that. Mm -hmm. And that was a horrific event in the American history. But if you think about Canada, only five years late before that, this, this amazingly huge part of our history also existed. So that's just a bit of context in terms of timelines for that. In terms of policies, um, we saw in that video that there were policies that brought around the uh, residential school. So it was tied to policy. And a lot of people ask us at ARPA about policy. And, um, and it's an important idea because change often gets embedded. And we even heard our elders say, if there is not change embedded in upper policy within your organization, the government and the federal government, change isn't really going to happen. So I just, we won't spend too much time um, on this, but we do want to just run through some things that uh, you should be aware of. And we will have links later to how you could find these documents. But one really important one is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, UNDRIP. And it, this is one of those international bits of policy that drive a lot of the work of which if you do advocacy, um, or any sort of important relationship building, it's important to know about this because it is a document that drives world's view in terms of the right of indigenous peoples. And as you see here, it's about culture, um, identity, employment, health, education, all of those packages. It happened in 2007. So Jess, I know you know the answer and it's actually on this slide, but when did Canada embrace the policy, United Nations? or they, they, had, they actually removed an objector status. Mm -hmm. What year was it, do you know? It's 2016, I'll tell you that. You're muted, so unmute. And, Am I muted? Oh, there you go. Um, but tell me, or can people guess, what was the objection based on? Why did Canada object? It was based on land. So it was land and governance. And um, the other nations who did not um, sign on originally, like at first were the States, Australia, and um, I believe New Zealand. And so it's interesting to think that those world powers are the ones who had um, objected to the original piece that was the United Nations. And all of those communities had 
um, colonize the indigenous people of that land. And um, I don't know if you know kind of your, your global politics, but a lot of similar issues and, and land uh, rights violations um, are happening in places like the States and New Zealand and Australia. And um, battles, I think, within the court systems are also things that are occurring um, much like what is happening in Canada. And so colonization was very similar in those places. Yeah. Um, so Jen, moving on, because again, um, this is just an overview. So here is an article, some of the articles that you're meant to um, take note of. I won't read them out. You could take note of them, like Jess said. You could pause this um, recording if you want to see it. But there are things about related to rights, exactly the thing that, um, that uh, Jess was talking about and the idea of good relations. And that's the theme for us today. So the TRC, so I'm just going to turn this over to you, Jess, um, to go over at a high level what the TRC meant. Um, and then we'll I'll talk about a few more policies. And then pop-up number two is complete. So the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada um, is something that you can access for free, the entire report um, and its findings, um, as well as action. Um, I think it's TRC, I think it's pretty simple, trc.ca, but I could be wrong. Um, Anyway, so it, its mandate was to learn the truth about what happened in residential schools and continue to inform Canadians about this history. Um, the Commission documented the truth um, and it relied heavily on the records of survivors. Um, these um, individuals often experienced re-traumatization due to these reports but also felt that the need was there to ensure that this didn't die with them if, if they didn't you know, live to see it to fruition. Um, so you seen in the video three commissioners, this is Honorable Justice Marie Sinclair as the chair, Chief Wilton Littlechild and Dr. Marie Wilson. Um, the Indi Indian Residential School Survivor Committee um, also supported the Truth and Reconciliation Truth and Reconciliation Commission through providing advice and support. Um, and traditionally, it was guided by the seven sacred teachings of the Anishinaabe. Um, but I think it's also really important to understand that truth and reconciliation requires so much more than just the apology. Um, the harm that was done um, is echoing through generations. So even though these schools are no longer open, um, we're still seeing the effects of these schools. Um, so it's really important to one, educate yourself and to, to find the truth, um, listen to the community members, but then until all Canadians understand that, um, we, we can't wor work towards the reconciliation in the way that needs to be. So this is just a bit of um, a comparison of children dying in Indian residential schools versus children dying, um, or sorry, versus individuals dying in World War II. So um, it's kind of a shocking comparison between something so um, traumatic in the world as, as a war versus something that was um, perceived by many people as a good thing for Indigenous people to be in residential schools. So much so that recently um, there has been comments made about maybe we should just bring residential schools back, um, which is um, an awful way to think about Indigenous people. Um, what should occur is maybe governance over school, over the education system for Indigenous people. Um, so yes, yeah, so some of the calls to action. Janet, I'll let you take this one on. Awesome. So this, this is one of the calls to, to action. So 87 to 91, we have links like Jess mentioned to this later on. We'll reference that. But there, like I said, there are various ways that we as a organization, as a sector, can approach the TRC. And just 89, for example, is one example of how you can do that. So there are many ways to use these policies to help advance your work as you move forward in what you do. So just a few more in our um, last few minutes that we have here today. 
You saw a mention in the video that Jess showed about the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls um, work happening. So since that video was made, there has been a National Inquiry final report. The interesting thing or the notable thing is that a lot of this violence towards Indigenous women, girls, the LGBTQ2 um, community, the rates of violence are still insanely high. Mm -hmm. So while that um, inquiry has happened, there are still definitely times and needs to move forward. It was out in 2019, so it's fairly new to us, but it's just notable that lots of work still needs to be done in this area. But of course, there are places for culture, for recreation and parks and culture to come together. And we all know what we do, we provide safe spaces. We allow um, time and um, programming to be dedicated to this work. So I think this is a huge role, a huge place for recreation and parks and wellness to come together in this work. And when you look at um, creating space for young women mm. to explore sport and recreation, you are also um, serving a community because in many and most situations, young women then you know, become life givers they have their own children. And so you have to look at the ripple effect of the way that recreation and sports can support Indigenous women um, in the future of, a, of an Indigenous community. Oh, absolutely. And I think too, also in 2015, um, the TRC, when the TRC came out, we also had a framework for a new framework for recreation in Canada, so a national document. And that also included a high level goal of that holistic approach to tradition, to culture, in terms of work in within community as Jess was saying. So if you talk about holistic, it means the family, the, the individual, the elders, the youth, the children, that seven generational look. And I think this policy for those who have to root their work in policy, all of these things are in place. And they have been in place for that long. If you think about it, if UNDRIP came in 2017, TRC 2015, that's five years ago. So we are really at the time, we are in front of the tide. We have the opportunity to make this change um, together and in collaboration with each other. And I think that is a very powerful thing in terms of um, the policy that we're talking about here. And whoa, we're already at pop-up number three. So um, let's start with awareness will be the next theme of our pop-up. Here's our information again, if you need it, contact us, talk to us, and um, we will be back with our next segment, let's start with awareness. <laughs> 